Good to go. So hi, everybody. Welcome to our lecture today. This is the third seminar in the series for PHR's um, Sexual and Gender-Based Violence Committee. Um, and so I have today two speakers who are going to come talk about um, LGBTQIA plus health um, in the context of the USA and also in a global sense. So I have Dr. Kevin Wang. He's the medical director of Providence Swedish LGBTQI plus program. And he's going to start us off with this national view on health disparities affecting um, the community. And then we also have Ami here, who is a director of humanitarian and global development programs at Outright International. And she'll be giving us more of a global overview of the health disparities um, as well. So I'll hand things off to Dr. Wang. Thank you. Really appreciate being here today. Um, and yeah, thank you for the invitation for letting us talk with you. Just to make sure, even though we should probably all be used to the Zoom model of meetings, people can see the screen all right? Or the presentation? Okay, great. Um, right. So first of all, hello everybody. Uh, good afternoon, good evening, depending on which part of the country you're in. Um, and we just kind of want to set a little bit of the stage just for um, our conversation today. Um, this is an opportunity for us to learn, to build community, and to really have as much of an interaction discuss or interactive discussion as we can. I know it can be difficult when we're all on Zoom. Um, but first of all, we're all here to learn. We all have differing and different uh, varying levels of uh, exposure and experience with the LGBTQI plus community, whether it's here, whether it's in your country of origin uh, from a global sense. And so um, please, please, please feel free to ask any questions. Please feel free to type in comments and questions in the chat. If you would rather do it verbally, please do so. Um, again, because we all have different uh, uh, levels of experience, no assumptions are made um, and we just want to learn. Uh, because this is part of the learning experience, we all make mistakes. Uh, I'm as, I am as identify as a gay male and I can uh, certainly make mistakes with the best of them. So. If you do hear anything which may be troubling or may be concerning to you, uh, again, feel free to put something in the chat, but let's all bring each other into the conversation so we can all learn from each other. Um, and if we're going through our slides and you just think, wow, it'd be really great if I could just ask a question because I want to make it more interactive. We're also happy to deviate from the slides because I know PowerPoint presentations can be a little bit on the uh, monotonous side. So please feel free to, uh, to chime in. Um, also, it'd be nice just to kind of um, talk a little bit about what we do. So since I just talked for about a minute or so, maybe Ami, if you want to introduce yourself, give a little bit more background to what you do, and then I will, um, I'll talk a little bit about myself afterwards. Sure, I'd be happy to. I, I'm noticing my photos a little disproportionately large here on this slide, but <laughs> anyway, my name is Ami Bishop, and um, I actually have spent a big part of my career in global public health. If any of you are, are uh, in Seattle, you might know a large global health NGO called PATH, where I was for 25 years, um, and then segued into doing consulting and, and now work for an organization called Outright International, as um, Leah mentioned, which is a global LGBTIQ human rights organization, uh, advocacy organization based in New York and, and uh, my role there. Is, is looking at the intersection of humanitarian and global development programs and, and needs and uh, LGBTI issues, including health. So I will stop there. I'm here in Seattle, Washington. I identify as a lesbian, uh, she, her pronouns, and um, mom of two adult sons. And I'm Kevin Wang. I use he, him pronouns. As Leah mentioned, I get to serve as uh, as the institution where I work, Swedish Health Services, which is part of Providence St. Joseph Healthcare System. Uh, and I serve as the medical director for the secular affiliate of Providence's LGBTQI plus program. Um, I am a family medicine physician by training and did my residency out in Michigan um, at a community hospital, and then um, moved out to Washington where I did an OB fellowship. And then um, I've served as faculty at the residency program here at Swedish at First Hill for about 11 years until I moved into my position as medical director. And I also get to serve as faculty with their OBGYN residency program as well. So great to meet all of you. What we're hoping to talk about today is help people gain a basic understanding of, and this is more from my um, 
interpretation of how LGBTQI plus health disparities arose from a historical perspective, uh, perspective in the United States, um, but also would love to maybe help identify what you can do in your career uh, to support LGBTQI plus communities. Um, and so those are my two main objectives and I will turn the other three to Ami to go into a little bit here. Um, oops, yes. Uh, yeah, I thought I would provide um, an overview of the sort of the, the state of LGBTIQ plus human rights globally, um, with a focus on not only um, some of the setbacks, but also some of the, the positive advances that have been made. Um, and then also uh, demonstrating some of the impacts of discriminatory social and legal environments um, and what they have, what the impact is on health and well being. Um, and then a few individual stories related to the theme based on some research that I've done over the last few years. So I'm going to kick things off and turn things over to Ami. And I do want just to give a fair warning. Uh, I don't know if y'all have gotten the slides yet or if you'll get them afterwards. We do have a lot of slides to go through, but um, we're not going to go through each single one. We're going to kind of go through them pretty quick. We really want to get to the question component. So. Um, before you know, we kind of go into where we are right now in the U.S., you know, believe it or not, when you, when you look at it from a global sense, and I'll turn those things over to Ami in a little bit, but um, the perspective of LGBTQI plus communities have, wasn't always in, seen in a negative sense. So there are lots of other populations and cultures where being LGBTQI plus identified is seen as, um, as, as quite a high station in their communities. They can be seen as holders of tradition and culture, and they're seen as teachers. Um, but it was in the United States where being LGBTQI plus identified was considered a crime early on in the establishment, or when we say establishment of the United States, but really invasion of, uh, of the lands of indigenous communities. And you can see this in examples of definitions in the dictionary and persecution, mainly from a religious sense, um, and then the restrictions and, and creation of laws. Um, for people who are, you know, mainly at the time in same-sex relationships. There have been a number of examples of groups uh, uh, later on in, in, the, in the United States history where people have opposed and resisted the discrimination and, you know, both implicit and explicit against LGBTQI plus communities. So uh, I'm not going to go into these into every single detail, but we have our pioneers of Val Martin and Phyllis Lyon, who created the Daughters of Belitis, and Henry Gerber, who created the Society for Human Rights, and Harry Hay, who created the Madison Society, which is a society which is still running today. So highly encourage you to check out these, um, these great historical figures. You know, when we talk about uh, acts of resistance and riots, the one which people most often associate with in the United States uh, is the, or are the Stonewall Inn riots. Uh, this happened in June of 1969, and if June, for whatever reason, pops into your head, this is the reason why we celebrate Pride every year in June, or whether you use it as a way of celebrating or remembering this was a first and foremost a protest. Um, again, this is why we celebrate Pride in June every year. Um, now, a lot of the community often went to bars and clubs and other underground areas where we could be our authentic selves. But bars and clubs often were one of the one of the first places, and um, the one in New York called Stonewall Inn is where a lot of people went to be themselves, and the club owners had to pay off the police in order to um, to stay safe. Uh, at this point, um, there was another riot which was unannounced, and the people who really started the riot and got people together uh, were trans women of color, so Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera. And they were the ones who really got things going, at least here in, in 1969. But I do want to emphasize there were other acts of resistance, again, led by our trans uh, pioneers. There was a Compton Cafeteria riot, again, another safe space for our trans and uh, gender diverse uh, communities to really be themselves. And this is really when they fought back. And so um, when we talk about the um, LGBT rights movement, um, it's, it's really important for us to remember where we came from and remember those who really got things started. Unfortunately, despite the acts of resistance and riots, um, there were many examples of federal legislation and federal executive orders, which continue to um, either um, 
target our LGBTQI plus community or because of the assumptions made of our communities, they kind of enacted some of these quite harmful uh, executive orders and uh, and actions. So one which was um, which which I learned about early on in sort of the my my research was Executive Order One Zero Four Five Zero, and this is something which happened uh, in the nineteen forties, and this was really when people were concerned about. Uh, the communist scare. This is where they were afraid there would be spies in the United States. And because they were, cons uh, well, one, uh, the environment was never inclusive for LGBTQI plus family members. Uh, and because nobody was really coming out, they were afraid communists would come in and blackmail federal employees who they suspected of being LGBT plus identified. And they were afraid communists would come in and um, sorry for the auto thing, but um, they would come in and blackmail them and say, if you don't uh, give us government secrets, we're going to out you. Uh, and so what the federal government did was they just fired over 5,000 employees uh, and also would not hire people based upon their uh, assumptions on LGBT plus identity. The FBI and police kept lists of who they suspected to be um, LGBT plus identified. Uh, and the U.S. Post Office also kept addresses of people's, uh, people's addresses where what, what they would consider to be salacious or LGBT plus materials were sent. Another one, another act of sort of, which will always, I think, be burned in people's minds is um, during the HIV epidemic. And so when they were first trying to figure out what was causing acquired immune deficiency syndrome, it was initially termed as GRIDS or gay-related immune, immune deficiency syndrome. This was something which initially um, uh, spread among uh, those who identified as men who had sex with others who identified as men as well. Um, and it was known as the gay plague, gay cancer, um, and even when health profession, uh, professionals were trying to find the cause, um, the, the administration at the time, the Reagan administration, really didn't do anything much about it. Um, and it wasn't until it started to really impact majority cultures, majority populations, did the Reagan administration finally do something. And it's, um, it was estimated thousands of people died unnecessarily because of the delay in, um, in, in identifying the virus, in um, creating tests, uh, and then leading to potential treatment options. Um, this is something, uh, you know, on a personal level, I've been following for quite some time. And, you know, it was just not even 10 years ago when the Supreme Court ruled in the case of Obregger Fell versus Hodges giving same sex couples the right to marry um, less than 10 years ago. And what was really scary was just last or just last year, this year, sorry, I think it was. I, the, the timing is now is just so last year was when Justice Thomas was quoted as saying the Supreme Court uh, should reconsider its 2015 court decision after the Dobbs decision overturning Roe versus Wade. And so the fact it's coming up even not even 10 years ago when the decision was made and to, to turn back the clock on, on rights is, is really quite horrifying. Um, despite increased visibility of our LGBTQI plus community members, um, there has been longstanding discriminatory, um, lack of, lack of anti-discriminatory uh, protections for LGBTQI plus communities. And it really wasn't until just the last few years in which um, uh, the Employment Non-Discrimination Act would include sexual orientation and gender identity from a federal perspective, but there are some states where these protections are not in place. Um, conversion therapy continues to be a concern where um, you know, less than half the states ban it. So for those of you who don't know, conversion therapy is uh, a form of therapy to, um, you know, cure someone's um, LGBT plus identity. Often it is uh, through faith-based uh, interventions, which have repeatedly, lots of evidence has shown to cause significant harm. Although this is something which has been, uh, which has uh, been under uh, investigation for a while and the FDA, uh, recently came out with some proposed revisions, the blood donation ban still continues to be in place for uh, those who identify as male who have sex with those who identify as male as well. Um, despite our advances in uh, detecting HIV uh, and other um, bloodborne conditions, uh, this is this is still a place where um, the, you know it's sort of a medical legal ability to discriminate against uh, against members of our community. Um, even though there is no evidence to suggest it, despite all the advances in medicine, uh, we are one of the last countries, last developed countries, 
who still have abandoned place. England, Brazil, France, Australia, Germany, Greece, um, all of these places have removed identity from, um, uh, from limiting people uh, uh, to blood donation and really focusing more on people's behavior. So those who inject drugs, those who may engage in um, unprotected sexual intercourse within a certain amount of time who may have been exposed to a sexually transmitted infection and not just banning people based solely on their sexual orientation and or gender identity. I'm sorry for going through these really quick. We just want to be able to talk with all of you. Um, and then, you know, again, there are lots of new legislation which is coming out. Um, Texas, for example, decided to try to bypass the legislative process by, um, by reinterpreting Child Protective Services rules to, um, to ban the ability of transgender adolescents from accessing gender affirming health care. Um, you know this is something which has been happening over the last number of years. This is a recent um, update uh, just for, uh, for this month. And the number of proposed anti-LGBT legislation across the U.S. is more than the last three years combined. And we're just in the first, what, third of the year. And so the fact this is happening just goes to show how, um, I, I'm, I apologize for making this a little bit political, but how LGBT plus identity is being politicized in order to further certain uh, administrations and parties' agendas. So, um, and this is something which uh, is commonly seen and you will hear more about it from Ami during her presentation. Um, even though this, and I apologize, this slide is old, there haven't really been any updates, but um, transgender health care protections um, are still limited to certain states. If you look at those who expanded Medicaid, those are the states where transgender health care is protected. And those who did not expand Medicaid are the places where protections do not exist. Um, I'm sure you have heard about things happening in South Dakota and Tennessee. I think there's another, Arkansas. Um, there are way, way, way many states which are proposing legislation to ban gender affirming healthcare for adolescents. As embarrassing as it is to say, um, the state of Washington, where I currently work, uh, there was a, a house bill which, uh, where they also proposed banning um, access for adolescent gender affirming care. Fortunately, it did not survive committee, um, but the fact that it even came up in as quote unquote progressive of a state as Washington um, is still quite concerning. You know, the impact it can have on youth, and I just want to share what concerns a lot of people in, in LGBT plus rights circles is how well organized um, these organizations, um, well, they're just extremely well organized. So when Florida came up with this Don't Say Gay bill, which essentially prevents um, youth and adolescents from being appropriately supported, talking about all forms of families uh, in, 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 in public schools, as soon as it passed in Florida, 17 other states immediately proposed similar uh, legislation. They're all just waiting for the one place for it to happen, and then they will immediately um, start proposing it as well, just because there is precedence. And unfortunately, there are more. Right. And so for those of you in the U.S., I've heard Tennessee being the first state to ban uh, to put a ban on public drag shows. Um, South Dakota uh, became the sixth state to restrict gender affirming care to minors, um, further putting people at risk, further stigmatizing the LGBTQI plus community, despite um, our drag queen and kings as, as being, again, just our 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 pioneers, our, our protectors. Um, uh, people who have really done a ton of community service, and yet they're being um, they're being targeted because um, you know uh, of their identity and being used as a political weapon. So if we want to turn things over a little bit in terms in terms of the medical perspective, we certainly have had our own journey as well. Um, it wasn't until 1973 did um, the DSM take off uh, homosexuality as being pathologic. And it was just 10 years ago when the American Psychiatric Association removed uh, someone's identity of being transgender, gender diverse as being pathologic and really focusing more on the societal impact and pressure, um, you know, sort of the, the impact on, on people's mental health as being the pathologic component rather than their identity as being someone who is transgender. Um, it was not even 20 years ago where medical schools revoked LGBT plus student groups uh, because of um, because of whatever concerns they had, fortunately they were they were uh, they were put back into place. But you know, as early as twenty years ago, those those student groups were not allowed to be in existence. 
when it comes to training healthcare providers, unfortunately, we are not doing a very good job. Uh, Healthy People 2020, in addition to social determinants of health, uh, indicating uh, to be a huge factor in the health of our LGBT plus communities. A main reason why healthcare disparities exist is because there's a shortage of healthcare providers who are knowledgeable, culturally competent, or culturally um, uh, humble enough to identify, we just don't know enough about the LGBT plus community. In 2011, there was a uh, there was an article uh, sort of who surveyed the deans of medical schools, and seventy and it shows seventy percent of medical school deans rated their LGBT plus training as fair or poor. If you uh, there was another one about looking at um, at health profession students and sort of their ranking of how we're doing uh, in 2017, and although many did feel comfortable providing care. Uh, maybe in a semi-LGBT plus informed manner, less than half felt their training prepared then. And if you were to separately um, survey uh, health profession students who identified as LGBTQI plus, they were far less likely than their cisgender heterosexual students to agree training was effective. There also was, um, let's see here, we'll talk about this uh, since you know we, we do like to work in a multidisciplinary approach. Social work education was also a significant concern. Uh, pharmacy schools also felt um, a lot of programs lacked LGBT, um, LGBT health topics. And pharmacy, as you can imagine, in the provision of care for gender diverse uh, patients is really vital um, to, to, to providing them appropriate hormone therapy. When you look at um, sort of the perspective on providers, uh, there was a 2017 Center for American Progress study where 10% of cisgender LGBTQ patients and 12 to 30% of gender minority patients felt the healthcare provider refused to see them, provide them care, or recognize their family, or even just outright um, uh, discriminated against them. About 10% of LGBTQ patients and 22% of transgender patients avoided or postponed care. So as you can imagine, you know, we want to be able to provide primary care and preventive care services in our clinics in an inclusive manner. And yet if they're afraid to come to us, they may not get to us soon enough in order to prevent colon cancer or cervical cancer. Um, and they may end up coming to the emergency room um, in, in late stages. And so the fact we, one, I don't think a lot of the healthcare institution and I love where I work, but we still have a lot of work to do when it comes to acknowledging the harm we caused and, and owning up to it. And not only just owning up to it, then what are we gonna do next, right? How are we gonna keep ourselves accountable? You know, when we start talking about family medicine, and I do apologize for being very specialty specific just because um, it's, it's, it's my specialty and I know more about it. Um, we, don't, we don't really do a very good job when it comes to training our clinicians. If you look at the milestones and the, and the requirements for residency training, uh, and those of you who are in med school will be very familiar with the letters A, C, G, and E. Um, in family medicine, there is one sentence where sexual orientation, gender identity is, is noted, and it's, we will train our residents to provide culturally competent care to people regardless of sexual orientation, gender identity, sex, race, ethnicity, religion, and so forth. That is the only place, despite the fact family medicine has been a specialty, which has been providing LGBTQI plus healthcare for a long time, but it's all stuff we either learned on our own, but to be honest, we often had to learn from our uh, from our LGBTQI plus community members. This is the part which was um, most difficult to find out, um, although the survey was done about 11 years ago, and I'm just gonna quickly go through some of the main points. About 16% of programs spent no time training residents in, our, in LGBTQI plus healthcare, while the majority spent maybe two hours in three years. Um, just to let you know, when we give orientation for our first year residents on providing gender affirming health care, we do a minimum of about four hours at the orientation, just in the provisions of the basics of gender affirming hormone therapy. About a quarter didn't address LGB specific health issues, while almost half did not address any transgender specific health issues. Um, and the part which really concerned me the most was about 12% of family medicine programs had some concern about ranking an openly LGB applicant, so lesbian, gay, bisexual, and over half, 51.1% of programs had some concern about ranking an openly transgender applicant. I think there were one or two which would say they would specifically not 
rank somebody who identified as gen transgender or gender diverse. Dr. Wang, may I ask a question? Please, thank you for breaking up. <laughs> <laughs> I've been um, sneaking in some uh, text into the chat. Oh, I'm sorry. I totally forgot. Okay. It's okay. No, it's fine. My name is Sherry. Um, I'm a student at Toro College of Osteopathic Medicine in Harlem, New York. Um, I'm a off-cycle fourth year, so I'm graduating in December. But I'm looking at this, um, the summary of 2012. And correct me if I'm wrong, and the same goes for Dr. Bishop, do you feel as I, I'm, I'm looking at these statistics and I feel like, especially in family medicine, this is not the case anymore. Wait, but you're kind of putting your head in your hands. Well, so um, I don't know. My experience has been, especially on the East Coast, in yeah. the North, because I'm in New York. So maybe I'm spoiled. I don't know. Well, you have places like the, in, the Family Medicine Institute, who exactly. is phenomenal. I love yeah. all of my friends who work there. And super yes. Um, I will, I'm going to say it's, so, so to answer your question or to comment, you know, is it getting better? I'm going to say yes. And uh, there is quite a bit of room for continued improvement. And the only reason I say this is because, and um, I think we're all guilty of this, my program included, is. We want to, we want, we're, we're trying to do as much work as we can, although, um, you know, some of it ends up just being a little bit on the superficial side, because in addition to wanting to make sure people are, pro are provided the training, um, a lot of things happen sort of in parallel, right? So we have to do the training, but in order to do the training, we also have to make sure people have an understanding of the historical context for disparities in LGBTQI plus healthcare, and the creation of an, of an inclusive environment. And so while I, I know, absolutely, I know residency programs are working to create an inclusive environment, what ends up happening is as you uncover things, as you sort of lift, you know, what is it, the rocks and you see all the things underneath, we end up exposing a lot of things we have either overlooked, ignored, or just flat out didn't know. And so I think this is the point in, 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 in the work we're doing in family medicine, particularly when it comes not just to LGBT plus healthcare, but really care for um, sort of minority populations which have been harmed. Um, this is sort of the part where we're ripping the Band-Aid off and it's, it's gonna be a lot of work until it starts to get better. I'm not gonna say, I'm hoping, I'm not letting you think it's gonna get worse before it gets better, but there's gonna be a lot of growing pains at the beginning. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Thank you for answering that. And I kind of feel like the, the getting worse before getting better. I, I, I don't think there's any denying that. I think we could see that by turning on the news and it's painful. Um, but at, at hearing someone like you say that on the other side of that, there is a getting better kind of makes me feel a little bit better because I just watch the news and go, Oh, like it's all, it's all crumbling down. And, and uh, I'm going to, I do want to end quickly so I can let, or not let, but I, I also want to learn from Abhi in just a little bit, but, um, you know, it's one, one thing a lot of people talk about is, you know, while we're doing this and um, wanting to increase access for hormone therapy, are we doing any, are we doing more harm by trying to increase access and, and maybe not have as much experience providing hormone therapy? Should we still limit it to those who do have the experience and should we, you know, and please take this for how I mean it, not how I say it, because I can't think of any other way to, to say it, but, you know, should we just be happy people can get access somewhere and is okay care good enough, or should we still try to get the best care? Because we don't want to hurt anybody, but it's not as, we, th there's a lot of growing things which is going to happen, but we also want to do it in a way which really prioritizes the needs of our LGBTQI plus members and not harm them, right? So just because they can get care doesn't mean um, it, 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 it may not be care, which may not be as up-to-date and evidence-based as we can. So it's, I hope you know what I'm, where I'm trying to go. I, I, I'm just not using the appropriate words. Sorry. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Um, again, sorry for having to go through these slides really fast, but, um, you know, long story short, you can imagine, um, all of these things, right? So, you know, 
I'm just going to use this term, gay people can't give blood, or we're going to fire people who are LGBT plus identified. We're not going to, now we're thinking about overturning marriage equality, right? So all of these things, certainly when I grew up, I thought being gay is bad, right? When I took the implicit association test from Harvard, and even though I haven't taken it in a while, but I did take it repeatedly over a number of years, I continue to show bias against um, against the gay community. And so a lot of this can be sort of internalized LGBTQI plus phobia or discriminatory behaviors, which can then further impact um, the, uh, the comfort where people want to seek out care. And as you can imagine, and this is stuff I never learned about in medical school, so I'm really grateful all of you are, are learning about this much more than I, uh, much more than I ever did. But all of these, you know, I'm going to take the example I hear a lot from people who are from Taiwan. Oh, your Chinese isn't so bad. I'm surprised we even know any Chinese at all. Or, wow, your English is pretty good. Or I'm sure all, many of us have heard on this call before. But where are you really from, right? And so all of those constant pressures, all of the news, that particularly our trans and gender diverse uh, communities are hearing, all of this added stress, as you know, raises cortisol increases the allostatic load, which then results in higher rates of uh, chronic conditions. And so all of this will start to impact um, our mental, physical well-being, which then, as all of you know, results in disparities and inequities, right? Lower rates of cervical cancer screening, not as great control of diabetes, increased rates of self-harm. Not only that, but even for those of us who want to provide healthcare, we still have these stereotypes in our minds, right? So back in Michigan, where I used to work, when I went to go see my primary care provider, they would always just say, hey, oh, you're gay? Well, let's make sure you get checked for HIV and sexually transmitted infections. And you don't do drugs, do you? And it's sort of, I'm here because I have a skin infection from a cut. So let's, we don't need to talk about it, right? And so keeping our stereotypes in check uh, can be really helpful in providing patients a safe environment. And even though... We've had many examples, particularly with HIV, we still end up stigmatizing a community. So just because one community was more prep, was more prone to getting certain conditions doesn't mean it's a gay disease. It's not a transgender disease. And so when you saw the CDC initially rolling out information when it came to um, MPV or monkeypox, um, separating out uh, uh, identity with epidemiology is still something we don't do a very good job doing. Um, I do want to, again, provide some time for Ami. So we talked about this a little bit when it comes to microaggressions and the, and the stress people feel. And for those who have the minority stress of, um, of one identity, you know, by being a child of immigrants, someone who's Chinese, someone who's also gay, um, somebody who may have, you know, who also has depression, all of these additional stresses result in us not really maybe exhibiting the best coping mechanisms because we don't really provide the resources and support for people to have positive, making, um, positive coping mechanisms. And this is just one identity, right? When we start thinking about all other identities, as I mentioned earlier, um, physical mental diversity, language spoken, age, right? We all know all of the disparities which we, uh, each of these identities carry all compound. I do just want to lightly highlight too, you know, we also just do a really bad job in data, in data collection, right? Um, if you look at a lot of healthcare systems, and this is this is Swedish, this was as, oh, this was last year, sorry, I just don't update it. But I think it just highlights a point where we don't do a really good job of, of, of doing population health data gathering, right? And so at this point, we only had about 20 plus percent of patients having sexual orientation, gender identity data collected. And if we don't have all the information gathered in an informed way, then we're going to do a really bad job of helping our patients with breast cancer screening or chest tissue cancer screening, screening for cervical cancer, colon cancer, diabetes management, right? Um, the fact we didn't collect LGBT plus data during the COVID, COVID pandemic, uh, uh, resources were not allocated to appropriate communities because we just didn't know, right? Even same thing for vaccine, um, vaccine studies. Um, there was no information of LGBTQI plus identity. And so really just wanting to emphasize, we have to, we have to start decoupling identity from epidemiology. There are some successes. I don't want us to think everything is awful and doom and gloom. Um, we have an administration who is really trying to be as supportive as possible. I just found out Michigan is expanding 
um, healthcare protections for our transgender um, patients there. Medical organizations are an increasingly supportive of LGBTQI plus health equity and social justice. Um, more LGBTQI plus people are running for election, uh, elected positions. Um, so um, although, as we just talked about, there's a lot of lots of band-aids getting ripped off, but hopefully we will be continuing to uh, uh, to move forward as uh, as we continue to do this work. So thank you for allowing me to share that with you. We'll do some Q&A in a little bit, and I will turn things over to Ami. Thanks so much, Kevin. Um, if you don't mind, I don't think I have the power to advance slides. There we go. Yeah. So um, I'm just going to try and run through, as I said, um, some of the issues that we see on a global level. Um, I uh, Some are very much the same, some are different. Uh, and uh, I, I'm the, starting with this map, not that you can read all every detail, but um, really look at the, the colors. The blue and bluish colors are where there are, generally speaking, more protective laws um, and uh, non-discriminate nation statutes, for example. Um, the uh, orange um, and, and darker colors, these are where there are um, laws on the books that criminalize same-sex uh, consensual relations. So about 67 countries in the world criminalize same-sex relations. Um, about eight of those have the death penalty. And um, and about, I think it's about 57 that have various sorts of laws that criminalize trans identities. So in the form of things like bans against cross-dressing or impersonating the opposite sex or debauchery laws and the laws that are used or invoked to crack down on diverse uh, sexual orientations and gender identities. Uh, next slide, please. So as I said, about 67 countries currently criminalize relations. Ironically, these are, I say ironically, because these are often relics of the British colonial empire legislation. And while um, the UK uh, has long since um, decriminalized uh, so-called sodomy, many of its former colonies continue to, um, to hang on to the law. And, and the other ironic part of this is that um, in many countries that are still fiercely holding on to these laws, uh, they, they decry what they perceive to be Western influence and Western, Western exporting of, of, of um, you know, same-sex behavior and sort of decline in values when actually it really was homophobia that was exported to these, to these countries. And, and to Kevin's earlier point about you know, pre-existing cultural norms in many countries were, were quite accepting of diverse sexual orientations and gender identities. There is some good news. Um, there are, are a number of countries that are starting to decriminalize. Um, just this earlier this week, the Cook Islands, teeny tiny country in the Pacific, decriminalized um, same-sex relations. So there is important progress. Next slide, please. Um, I just want to mention quickly India, because India being um, soon to be the most populous country in the world, I think in a, in a matter of months, it's going to overtake China. Um, they decriminalized in 2018, and it was historic, not just because of the size of, of the country and the influence it has in Asia and even more broadly, but because the, the ruling was unanimous and spoke to this issue of um, decolonizing. What they, what they said was that um, to, by decriminalizing, they were sort of shrugging off the last vestiges of colonialism. And this has, uh, a, a, it's, a, it's an argument that is much broader than has to believe been made on sort of right to privacy, more narrow arguments and resonates very strongly with activists in many of the former British colonies. Next slide, please. Um, marriage equality uh, is, um, you know, not as not as uh, prevalent. You can see sort of how it uh, it maps out there. Partly, though, I have to say that in many countries, especially the countries that are they're still criminalizing countries, marriage equality is so far from what people activists on the ground perceive to be their their next, you know, fight. They're still fighting for safe for dignity, for access to education, all the sort of basic rights, freedom from violence. And so 
um, marriage equality is not the first and foremost thing that that they're going to be arguing for at the moment. Next slide, please. Um, this was certainly a victory uh, at, at, at the global um, sort of the global level and then the, the uh, uh, ICD-11, it's the International Classification of Diseases latest edition. Finally, just, I mean, in 2018, so just a few years ago, um, has a depathologized uh, transgender uh, lifestyle. If they, if, I don't, not, not lifestyle, I don't mean that, I mean um, existence, identity. Next slide. So unfortunately, we are seeing backlash just as we're seeing it, as, as Kevin described in this country in the form. Um, oh, that's interesting. I just saw your 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 message, Kevin, about the US still using ICD-10. Interesting. Um, there is some significant back, backlash um, as as we are unfortunately want to see when when progress is being made or when visi more visible activism is um, is becoming apparent. Uh, next slide, please. So you may have been hearing in the news. Um, I don't know if if any of you have, but um, there is a law that has been um, passed by the parliament in Uganda just a few weeks ago that, if passed, will be uh, absolutely the worst law on the books in the world. Uh, Uganda, by the way, already criminalizes same-sex consensual uh, relations, sexual relations. Um, they want to. Uh, uh, essentially uh, worsen the penalty. They are inventing terms like aggravated homosexuality, which means repeated uh, instances of same-sex sex for which you will receive the death penalty, normalization of homosexuality, which means that if you in any way provide education, provide um, safe workplace by having non-discrimination statutes in your, in your work environment, th these are all considered normalizing. Um, there is um, uh, a duty to report, which is really a heinous um, provision, which means that if you know anyone, if you are, if your students, if your neighbors, if your family members, if you, if you even think that they might be LGBT, that they, you have the duty to report them to the police. So, so this has impacts, not just you know, on LGBT people in Uganda, it is it is going to severely um, impact how Ugandan society functions if it's passed. Um, today, just about a, a couple of hours ago, I saw that the the president uh, they're waiting for the president to sign it. He's now sent it back um, to the court uh, to have a look at some of the provisions. Um, because he wants to look at how people can be rehabilitated. And you can be sure what he's talking about there is imposing so-called conversion therapy um, on people, which is which is uh, something I know a bit about uh, from doing some, some uh, research on that phenomenon globally. Next slide, please. Ghana has something similar. Um, they have the promotion of proper human sexual rights and Ghanaian family values bill. Again, a country that already criminalizes, um, but but wants to um, actually uh, increase the severity of of the of penalties, and and they they do have a, a provision in this draft law that mandates conversion, so called conversion therapy. Next slide. Um, and then there's sort of this whole. Uh, Kind of area of anti-trans, anti-gender, anti-propaganda laws, and they and they 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 overlap uh, somewhat with what we see in this country. Um, and let me just pause for a second and say that all of what I'm talking about there, the source, a, a big source of of these really horrible um, legal changes um, stem from evangelical Christians based in the West and in the U.S. in particular. Uh, and um, and that is well known. We talked earlier. Kevin mentioned how well how how uh, powerful I think you said um, are are uh, the proponents of sort of cracking down on transgender lives and LGBT rights and all of that. It's happening on a global level, and it's very well resourced and very scary. But this whole this whole area is sort of 
part of this broader discourse related to reviving traditional values and scape so, scapes go, scapegoating, sorry, um, LGBT people as corrupting influences from the West. And, and you know, you, you then, all of those messages, just as, as Kevin's presentation so clearly showed, really has um, an incredible impact on people's lives in, in, the, in the form of rises in, in violence, in further stigmatization and exclusion, um, and, and also a crackdown on the organizations and activists in various countries around the world who are trying to push for equal rights. Next slide, please. Uh, even in Ukraine, um, the this this sort of uh, Russia has something called the anti-gay propaganda law. It's actually got a longer name than that, but that's the shorthand for it. Which they just, uh, which initially was um, was allegedly aimed at protecting children against the corrupting influences of of um, uh, LGBT rights and and life. And um, and uh, now just recently, the Russian uh, parliament has. Uh, extended that to adults as well. So you are you are banned from saying anything that is, it's again, it's kind of this normalization um, concept. Uh, anything that normalizes um, LGBT lives is prohibited. And you see here the, the Russian Orthodox Church even blaming the war on the fact that that Russia needs to defend uh, its its family values and and that Ukraine has been corrupted uh, by by the West among other ar arguments. Next slide. Um, there has been some, some work specifically on the issue of discrimination uh, in the, in, outside of the US, although I have to say there's not a lot of data. Um, what I have to say is largely based on studies that have been done in the US and, and in, other, in Europe and other countries. But there's, there's a fair amount of qualitative work that has been done. Um, so, for example, this report, which uh, is uh, about five years old on um, the situation for um, in the context of health care provision in Uganda. Next slide. So I'm not going to go through all of this. I think I think that Kevin's presentation covered some of the issues that have to do with more have to do with the fact that um, health care settings are very are, are often unfriendly and not competent when it comes to providing good quality care for LGBT um, IQ plus clients. Um, I would say that uh, there are a couple of other dimensions to this when you look at the global picture, which is um, where HIV, for example, is um, you know in, in some parts of Sub-Saharan Africa, um, very high rates, and you see that men and men who have sex with men have rates that are four to nineteen times um, higher uh, in terms of having HIV than the general population. I have a couple of slides to to show that. Um, and violence is many things. It's it is, in my view, also a, a public health emergency and a, and an issue that needs to be dealt with. Um, and so we're going to talk a little bit more about that. Next slide, please. Um, again, mental health. I, I think we've covered the, the issue of minority stress. stress. All, all of the issues that Kevin talked about very much apply uh, and um, consider that in the environments in which some people are, are living um, may be even more hostile than what, what uh, existed in the, in the places where these studies took place. Next slide. Um, an interesting way to look at some of the um, the issues related to uh, the cost of discrimination, and and I, I mentioned this. I mean, this is a larger argument about why an economic argument about why discrimination is bad for countries. But interestingly, they use health care indicators as part of that argument. So this was a this was a study that looked at Kenya and um, looking at the burden of HIV and the burden of depression and showing um, how that translates into um, the costs due to negative health outcomes, which are due in fact to discrimination. Um, one would like to think that the, the sort of moral and ethical argument for, for rights would be sufficient, but um, I think we'll, we'll looking at other ways to make the case um, is, is welcome as, as well because we need all the all the arguments we can get at this point. Next slide. 
Uh, this is just a, a, a quick look at some the disparate HIV prevalence rates uh, across a number of countries, the blue being the aggregate um, uh, MSM men who have men who identify as men having sex with men who identify as men um, against uh, general population data. So you can see the, the disparate rates there. Next slide, please. Um, this is a, a quick look at ARV antiretroviral therapy coverage among trans women um, compared to all women in Nigeria. The, these are states across the um, horizontally. And so, and the gray dots up above are, are all women. So you see this huge disparity in ARV coverage. And that speaks really very directly to the the atmosphere um, and climate in which trans women and trans people have to, um, you know, survive. Actually, next slide. Uh, this was a study that looked at the impact of criminalization on um, HIV service uptake. Um, so it was across twenty eight countries, and you know, just a couple of highlights or lowlights, if you will, from this study that. Um, only about a quarter of HIV positive men were taking medication um, and, the, and they, they directly tied the harsher the, the laws, the legal environment, the lower rates of HIV testing, for example, um, uh, that was occurring among, uh, among gay men. Next slide. Uh, this was uh, the uh, 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 report on the impact of what, what's called the same-sex marriage prohibition law in Nigeria. Nigeria also already criminalizes same-sex relations, but they um, introduced this law and was passed uh, as a way actually to crack down on um, further activism, freedom of assembly. Um, there were suddenly, based on this law, uh, accusations of of marriages happening when it was really people having parties. It was kind of a a way to crack down on the community, actually. But what is striking was um, a population council, which is an international um, reproductive health and rights organization, uh, had a clinic uh, in Nigeria. And when this law was passed, they went from reaching seventeen hundred men in three months down to half, and then down to zero because of the, the threats and fears uh, among um, the patients who simply stopped coming, did not feel that it was safe to come any longer. Next slide, please. Uh, again, this is a quick picture of, of the, the, the dark uh, color is post this law, the lighter is pre, um, so just the, the impact on things like fear of seeking healthcare, um, having avoiding health care, being verbally harassed, being blackmailed. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, I just gonna a couple of words. It's a little bit of a trigger warning, in fact, um, on violence because there there has uh, I, I think unfortunately, LGBTIQ plus people in in some of these harsher countries are um, subjected to really profound levels of violence and threat of violence. Next slide, please. Um, a phenomenon that we've documented and others have documented called corrective rape, which occurs in South Africa um, and in other parts of Southern Africa. Next slide, please. Um, this is a study on violence among MSM in various countries you see. And this is, um, I think, 2016. Yeah, between 2012 and 2016. So it's a bit old. But in Uganda, um, already over 60% of of men who have sex with men um, reported uh, experiencing physical violence. And I'm afraid it's probably worse now. Next slide, please. Uh, this, is a, this is a trans murder monitoring um, program. And this is a map of absolute numbers of trans people who've been killed uh, since 2008. Um, and what's interesting here, I mean, which is it's the, whole, the whole picture is, is very tragic. But um, you see the disproportionate um, uh, numbers, uh, particularly in, in uh, southern, uh, the southern South America region, but also in the U.S. Next slide, please. 
2019, I, I led some research on the nature and extent of so-called conversion therapy globally. Next slide. Uh, we hadn't ever really documented what was happening. Um, we'd been hearing anecdotally, but all of the published work really was from the US and uh, Europe and Australia. Um, we did a survey, plus I interviewed uh, survivors from about 11 countries. Um, and um, essentially what our data showed is a sort of preliminary look is that these practices occur everywhere. Um, they're not, they're not the, the terms for, for these practices don't, it's not conversion therapy, that's a Western term, but, um, but uh, they certainly occur and are uh, very much driven by uh, religion in many cases. Next slide. Thank you for coming. This is someone I interviewed who I think really captures what, how damaging conversion so-called therapy is in saying that it's, um, sorry, off, um, that it's, it's a process of continued degradation and assault on the core of who you are. And so you can imagine the, the mental health impacts that these practices have, as I think um, Kevin also mentioned. Next slide, please. Uh, I also led a, stu a, a, a qualitative uh, study on the impact of COVID on LGBT people glo globally. We did about, um, we did 59 interviews across 38 countries. Next slide. And um, I, I won't go through all of this, but really very, we did this study in, in 2020, May of 2020, so early in the pandemic. So a lot of the impacts on people had more to do with the measures that were taken you know, to prevent infection. So the lockdowns and all of that. And, and you know, many LGBT people around the world, because they've been bullied out of school, because they've been, um, you know, uh, unable to, to access good jobs in some cases because of prevailing discrimination, many work in the informal sector. So of course, with lockdowns, they move very quickly into poverty. And we definitely uh, heard that m many times in terms of food insecurity and, and, um, uh, and, and uh, real uh, concerns about you know, survival. Next slide. Um, this is just a little bit more about on that theme in terms of disparities in access to food support. We were hearing stories, for example, that in Sri Lanka, a country that criminalizes uh, LGBTI people, food, uh, the, the, the local government was distributing food packets from police stations, which is, of course, the last place people, uh, LGBT people felt comfortable going to collect their food. Next slide. Uh, disruptions in healthcare are a huge issue for, for queer people, in particular for trans and intersex people, disruptions in access to their hormones, um, and certainly disruptions in access to HIV, HIV meds and other, you know, of course, other uh, management of other chronic health needs, um, delays in healthcare seeking when getting COVID, really not wanting to go for testing, go for care until you were really sick. It's something uh, Kevin also mentioned earlier. Next slide, please. Uh, and then elevated risk of family and domestic violence, being forced back into homes that are not friendly. Um, and so Ephraim here from Sri Lanka talked about um, bringing, uh, uh, providing temporary housing to uh, someone he knew who had been kicked out of his, his family um, because he was caught holding hands with his boyfriend. Next slide. And social isolation. I think we should we can continue on. Thanks. The last thing I want to just mention, I think this is the last thing, is that there there is an attempt on the global development sort of stage of so there's something called the Sustainable Development Goals, um, and UN Agenda 2030, and there are a set of 17 goals and something like 169 targets. There's not a single mention of health and well-being related to LGBTI people's lives. But there, there, there's been a real effort to look at these goals and to do advocacy and to push for um, inclusion as these goals are being pursued through the you know, global development and humanitarian uh, and UN um, system.
Next slide. What can you do? Here we are. Thank you, Ani. Um, you know, this is something I, I wish I had known a little bit more and I can give you a little bit of guidance when it comes to um, what we have available here in the in the US. But I think the, the first thing is, is getting to know your local LGBTQI plus community, meeting with the leaders, leading, meeting with their the community-based organizations. I certainly know, I think I still remember what it was like to be uh, a med student. And, you know, I think they'd be happy to meet with you. There's going to be a lot of time investment just because often there are a lot of sort of one-off conversations community-based organizations have with healthcare institutions where it's sort of, oh, just another person paying lip service. And, you know, to be honest, it took our program quite a bit of time with our local LGBT plus uh, organizations to really build the, to, to build some trust. Um, you know, if your medical school can support it, um, we have been able to find some funds in order to, uh, to pay community-based organizations for their time and expertise to really just honor the work, their time and their expertise. Um, knowing, you know, finances are, can, can be, can be complex, especially at larger institutions. Um, I put in some links for national LGBTQI plus advocacy organizations focusing mostly here in the US. Um, and then some medical organizations with LGBT resources. And then I just put in a couple, um, a couple, uh, uh, links I put in just to learn more about the history of the LGBTQI plus community. And yes, Outcare is, is a great place to find a mentor as well. Um, if you're looking more for the medicine component of it, um, here are some uh, great guidelines. Uh, WPATH or the World Professional Association for Transgender Health came out with their standards of care version eight just last, uh, last September. Fenway Institute has some great education materials and webinars on their website. Um, a lot of us use uh, University of California San Francisco guidelines for gender affirming hormone therapy, uh, which uh, pretty much coincides and aligns with endocrine society guidelines as well. In terms of federal legislation, just things I you know hope if people want to keep in mind, these are some things which are on the radar of of the uh, of sort of federal legislation. So. Do No Harm Act, which is amending religious freedom and restoration to protect religious freedom without allowing the infliction of harm on other people. Equality Act, which still continues to be um, a concern of ours today, which is yet to pass um, uh, to pass Congress. Uh, there's a PrEP Access and Coverage Act, which during the pandemic, there was a lot of funding issues. So a lot of communities were unable to access PrEP services. Um, the transgender military service, although members are able to serve in every, every, every branch, their careers still remain at risk um, until legal challenges to the ban are resolved in federal court. So still a lot of work which has to be done on a federal level. I wish I could put in more information on the different states, but then I think I'd still be preparing for this talk. <laughs> um, and highly encourage people to check out Outright Action International's website as well. Um, it's how I... Um, I ended up getting connected with Ami at a random, uh, first I met somebody, which then I got a chance to meet with Ami. And so they do amazing, amazing work. Yeah, outrightinternational.org. And thank you for letting us talk with you. I, I like this picture because it shows, you know, a plant or flowers uh, surviving and thriving in what looks to be an inhospitable environment. And it's something I really, if you, um, there are a lot of surveys which talk about the, um, at least here in the U.S., LGBTQI plus members' perception of how things are going. And despite um, the continued threats and harms, especially now more than ever, um, LGBTQI plus people are still very proud of their LGBT plus identity uh, and the communities we build. So um, thank you for letting us talk with you. Here are our email addresses. And I mean, I don't know if you have a, ending comment for us. No, it's been really a pleasure. And I know that, that um, you know, my, my, my remarks and my work is more globally oriented, but I hope it's helpful in, in at least informing maybe in some way um, when you're working with patients and communities that are immigrant communities or coming from, from other settings where unfortunately things are still very, very difficult. 
Yeah, thank you both so much for such a great lecture, very comprehensive um, and something that I personally was looking for in my medical education. Um, I'd like to open the floor for any questions. Can you give a few minutes for people? Thank you, Sherry, for all your good comments. I'm happy you appreciated them. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and if nobody has any questions, I'll maybe ask a few of mine. Um, but as somebody that is, I'm an MS4, and I'm applying to residency soon, and I'm really looking for LGBTQI plus healthcare training in my residency. Like I want a program that values that. And Dr. Wang, you mentioned that a lot of these programs actually don't have what I'm looking for. I was just wondering if you have any suggestions on like how, like what questions I could ask or subtle things that I should look for in programs I'm interviewing. So wanting to make sure you prioritize your education, I don't think this is a time to be subtle. Um, I would highly encourage, because right now, especially in certain specialties, family medicine included, we are looking for um, you know, really fantastic um, people who are not afraid to speak their minds. And so um, I'd say if you're looking, you know, if you like a program and you're getting a good sense, but you don't see anything on their website or anything, or um, not a lot of mention of it during your interview process, just ask them, do you have an LGBT plus, uh, you have an integrated LGBT plus curriculum? And if they don't, my recommendation would be to ask them, well, you have one person right now who's very interested in your program who wants you to create one. Tell me how, tell me how that would work. Tell me, give me examples of resident led uh, curriculum changes. And if they say, oh yeah, our residents are totally involved, but they can't give you any specific examples, I would consider it to be a red flag because then it tells me, um, I, did, I mean, they may not have the bandwidth, but I totally understand it. Um, but if they can't give you examples, I, I would be a little bit, I would be um, a little bit concerned. If they can list you, these are the things we do. These are the opportunities for our residents. This is how things have been going. And this is what we hope to evolve. I think it speaks very highly of that program for sure. Um, at least in family medicine, I know there are some Facebook groups out there. I don't have a Facebook account, so I don't know where it's located, but there are Facebook groups where um, medical students and residents who have graduated from med school will continue to uh, add in programs and information about um, their respective programs and the work they're doing. Uh, I'm sure there are similar ones for other uh, medical specialties as well. But don't be subtle. Thank you. Yeah, I think, I don't know, as a shyer person, that's a little bit scary for me, but I, I like that, like advocating for myself and like what I want. Yeah. Um, and then Ami, I had a question for you. Um, I volunteer with my schools as I'm evaluation student clinic, um, and many of our clients are LGBTQI plus identifying asylum seekers, and they've overcome like a lot to get here. Um, but I was wondering if you had any insight kind of into the intersection between um, the identity and the asylum seeking process and does identifying openly as LGBTQI plus and sharing their story affect their chances of getting asylum? In this country, it should help. Um, if, if they can demonstrate, I mean, I, so I'm not an immigration lawyer and asylum lawyer specialist by any stretch, but I've actually worked with some because I've had, I've in the past provided um, background like country profiles um, to help the case of like, for example, someone who was applying for asylum from the Gambia. Um, at a time when the situation for LGBT people was just horrible there. Um, but if if an a, a asylee, someone who's who's seeking asylum can um, essentially demonstrate a credible fear of persecution um, based on it's it's a as I understand it, the law doesn't call out your LGBTIQ status, it's, it's, they have a more vague term called, I think it's called membership into a particular social group. So in other words, fear of persecution based on race, religion, um, nationality, membership to a certain social group. That's, that's the part that can be used under the Trump administration. They tried to um, tighten what could be included in that social group definition. So they tried to make gender not be part of it. And it was actually, uh, there was an injunction um, by a federal judge to, to block that because that would have then made it impossible in some cases for, for women who's, who are suffering from domestic violence, but also on the basis of gender identity. Um, but yes, um, it, it, uh, if you can establish that you, you fear, have a credible fear of persecution and violence based on your um, your identity, uh, sexual orientation, gender identity, then it should help. 
it's hard for people because they don't necessarily, they're not used to being able to be safely open and out. And so now you're asking as part of this process to do so. And that, that can be very difficult for people. Yeah, that's really good, like heartening information to hear. Yeah, because I definitely had a client who was really worried about sharing their story for that reason. So mm -hmm. um, it's nice to have that kind of information to provide them. Yeah. Any other questions from anybody? Okay, well, if not, then we'll probably end it here. I'll end the recording.